Welcome to Dance Beat Presents a Cheeky Chat with Chris Johnston. Now, if you have watched any of my previous interviews, you know that I get to meet a lot of very interesting people. And uh, the young gentleman that I'm going to speak to today is Dr. Len Marcus. Now, why am I speaking to him? Well, he is a pro-am dancer. And he's a bit, a bit different from most pro-am dancers because his speciality is showcases and he's got a very unique way of preparing for showcases so he is going to talk me through what his thought process is when he decides to do a showcase but before he does that dr marcus can you just tell me a little bit about your background not your dance background but your professional background well born and raised in philadelphia uh, across the street from Fairmount Park, where my father often took me out for nature hikes, which got me interested in natural history. A determination at age five that I was going to be a biologist of some kind. And to me, uh, medicine is just a specialty of biology. Uh, I went on to get a degree at Penn State University in agriculture. A Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree at University of Pennsylvania and uh, after serving in the US Public Health Service uh, during the Vietnam War uh, in a program comparing heart disease in animals and people that was my assigned role by the government working with a lot of physicians I got interested in human medicine uh, and as my veterinary colleagues often point out to me, I'm not smart enough to handle more than one species at a time. So I went to medical school to learn something about human medicine um, and had a career of what is now called uh, One Health or Comparative Medicine, uh, in which I was very interested in diseases going from animals to people. Of course, we're experiencing the terrible coronavirus uh, now, and I'm actually happy that I'm retired for more than 10 years and not dealing with that terrible condition. Um, but um, that, in brief, is my educational background. Uh, my specialty included tropical medicine, parasitic diseases, uh, I took care of people before going on African safaris, giving them appropriate immunizations, anti-malarial medicine, advising them how to stay well, and if they didn't follow my advice, I was happy to take care of their tropical diseases when they came home. So that's my uh, professional background, independent of anything to do with dance. How did you actually find your way to a dance studio? Well, first, in my mid-40s, I had a midlife crisis and got very interested, uh, of all things, in breakdancing, which not every 45-year-old does, and ended up taking a couple of uh, workshops with Rennie Harris, one of the country's foremost uh, hip-hop choreographers, who now does choreography with Alvin Ailey. Len, I'm not going to ask you how old you are. <laughs> But, come on, the midlife crisis, what did it teach you to do? There's one move out of hip hop that signifies the transfer of energy and you can you incorporate this in all kinds of dance rhythms from um, Viennese waltz to the fastest of uh, um, uh, Latin music and that is the wave. It's a matter of transferring and using isolations and you can bring your movement going across the body and down and up the leg and across the other way and you can hesitate and you can stop and start and express rage or surprise or happiness all kinds of different expressions can be made just with this motion of the wave. And it's also a way of transferring energy to your partner. So it's a signal that you want someone over there to do their move. 
And if you're in isolation, you can even send that signal across the entire ballroom floor. So, we will now find out how Len goes about preparing for a showcase. Well, it's an opportunity to be unique, to express yourself, to give a totally different perspective of dance, uh, a different feeling to it than just the straightforward uh, choreographic movements. And um, the single line that I most appreciate after I give a performance, if someone wants to come up and uh, compliment me, if they say they were entertained, then I feel like I've accomplished what I wanted to do. Now, storylines have a history in dance, and when you think about how dance began in the development of civilization, from the most primitive of societies coming out of caves into agricultural communities and cities and city-states, and unfortunately part of society has always been preparation of battle and warfare between states. All of these gave backgrounds for dance as preparation. Preparation for the hunt, preparation for battle, celebration over victory in the hunt or victory in battle, lamentation over defeat and also uh, celebrating momentous occasions within the society. The naming of a king or queen, uh, someone becoming pregnant, uh, having children, uh, the uh, child growing into adulthood and becoming whatever profession or warrior uh, or whatever class that person became all were celebrated in dance. So this is the historical perspective uh, storylines have always been a part of dance. How do you then choose which story you're going to tell? Well, you listen uh, carefully to music uh, as you're driving in a car, um, as you go to dance parties, and you think, how can I uniquely change the dance pattern of that song? What is there that suggests a storyline? The very first showcase that I did was a number called Electricity. Mm -hmm. And the name itself immediately suggested energy. And the words, if you listen carefully to the song, uh, I think it's by Midnight Star, if I recall correctly, um, suggests the transfer of energy from one partner to the other. And uh, we carefully do that throughout the song, and that was the storyline uh, suggested uh, by the words. Um, less commonly, the music will suggest a storyline, and the only time in which a purely instrumental number inspired me was uh, the classical number Bolero. Mm -hmm. And in Bolero, uh, the classic number with a capital B, not a small b, the dance bolero, um, there is increasing intensity with incorporation of more and more instruments, uh, uh, starting as essentially just with the sound of a snare drum, uh, and then more and more instruments come in until the full orchestra is blasting away at the end, uh, but the uh, musical phrase is repeated again and again with 45 second intervals with each phrase. And what it suggested to me was increasing intensity of relationship of a man and a woman, first beginning with a very shy and bashful approach at the soft beginning of the number, uh, building up with increasing intensity uh, and closeness of uh, the partners. So uh, this was an instance in which the instrumental music inspired the story. Uh, you can also look for double entendres, double meanings. And I remember being in the car and listening um, to a playing of uh, What a Little Moonlight Can Do. And clearly the lyricist who composed that number had in mind that uh, Moonlight was inspiration for romance. But what it immediately suggested to me 
is moonlight is the energy required to change a person into a werewolf. <laughs> and uh, that was the storyline uh, that we incorporated uh, for that number. It begins with uh, a man and woman dancing together happily, like boyfriend, girlfriend type of thing. Uh, but we go behind the screen uh, to change into a werewolf as, and the uh, version of the song that we choose is very deliberate, it has a long instrumental beginning. So there is an opportunity just to see the man and woman dancing together. Um, and as is often the case with jazz numbers, you have the rhythm, but you don't have the melody. So there's no clue, unless you're familiar with the specific recording, what is coming next? And you hear this long uh, instrumental playing, uh, man and woman dancing, they go behind the screen and now the lyrics begin, what a little moonlight can do, and out we come as werewolves. So that was how that storyline developed. So um, now how else can you develop a storyline? There could be important things in your life, a unique opportunity occurred when a storyline occurred to me completely independent of any music. I used to enjoy fishing a great deal and it struck me wouldn't it be funny to have a storyline where somebody would rather go fishing than dancing with a beautiful girl. So in detail, down to the last detail, I had the thought of a storyline of uh, sitting there with a fishing pole a lady coming along, enticing me to dance. I say no. Uh, she grabs my hat to uh, entice me to follow her, um, forces me into a dance hold. We do a country and western or some sort of dance. Uh, but I keep trying to get away from her to go back to the fishing hole. And um, at the end of the story is I literally drop her to run back because I think I've caught a big fish. It turns out I have a rubber boot attached to the end of my line and she runs away from me in disgust. So that's what you drop me for and I realize the error of my ways and throw the line into the pool, which is just a kiddie's waiting pool is what we use, um, and throw that line uh, into the uh, pool and follow her, that's the exit. Well, this entire storyline occurred to me before I had any idea what music I would do it to. And the way I found the music was going on YouTube, entering songs about fishing. They suggested funny songs about fishing, so I clicked on that. And sure enough, the second song suggested was, I want to go fishing. I listened to the lyrics and to the music and it perfectly fit the storyline that I already had in detail in my mind and that's the way that one developed. For me, I had major hip surgery which really disabled me for a while. Um, dancing was part of my therapy to come back post-operatively and in appreciation of that, um, I developed a story uh, to you make me feel so young and I come out hobbling on a cane um, and my dance partner grabs the cane away from me and uh, uh, starts me dancing uh, to restore me back to life and all of that was inspired by the real life situation of recovering post-operatively. So now you've got your story. How, what is the first thing you do to start actually developing that so that you can do it on a dance floor? Well, a story, it has to have a clear beginning, a clear ending. The two have to be related to each other. And there has to be stuff in the middle that connects the two. So um, I always begin with that idea in mind. Oh, there has to be a very clear cut obvious beginning. There's no subtlety to it. And uh, the subtlety comes in with uh, attention to detail, which I can get into in a moment. But um, uh, you can have a surprise ending. 
So it can be, uh, for example, like it is uh, no parking on the dance floor, where uh, it begins with people blowing their horn, uh, asking a lady to get her uh, car moving, and a policeman comes along and says, if you don't get a move on your body, I'm going to be forced to give you a ticket. So that is a clear beginning of the dance story. I come out as the policeman. My partner is uh, seated behind a model uh, car on the floor. Uh, she is texting, uh, paying no attention to the traffic behind her. I'm threatening her with a ticket. And the storyline is she is going to seduce me out of giving her a ticket, which then results in a very seductive dance. Now you can have a surprise ending. Um, people assume, knowing my partner, that she would be capable of seducing someone very easily. <laughs> and uh, a beautiful young lady, and uh, assume that's the way the storyline would end. Unfortunately, I take her back to her car at the ending, and she, uh, as soon as my back is turned, she picks up her phone and starts uh, texting again. I, the, uh, we have the uh, beginning of the song is played again with the horns honking. I turn around realizing she has paid no attention to me and my warning, and I give her a ticket at the end. And that's how, that's a surprise ending, so people didn't expect that. Um, if you have a change in the storyline, it should be obvious. I already refer to uh, the dance where I begin uh, with my partner, uh, two uh, human beings, man and woman, dancing together. And we change into a werewolf at the end. Uh, the change is permitted by our going behind the screen. So there's clearly that going behind the screen is not only an opportunity uh, to change costume, but a signal to people that there's going to be a change in the storyline. So you go from a person to a werewolf, and that's how that storyline progresses. Uh, another one is in another werewolf dance that we did. I happen to like werewolves quite a bit. It's part of my background as yeah. both a veterinarian and a physician. Um, I bring that to the dance floor. Um, and um, uh, there, again, the, the song that inspired me is The Way You Look Tonight. And I thought, well, that's how a male werewolf would express his love of his female werewolf partner. He appreciates the way she looks tonight. And how is he going to express that? He's going to give her a gift. What would a female werewolf like? So I got a severed arm, <laughs> rubber arm from a costume shop, and we put this under a uh, piece of uh, uh, artificial grass, astroturf, uh, in a cemetery plot. And at the beginning of the dance, I uh, go to that astroturf and uh, dig up the uh, arm to present to her as a gift. Now, the detail is when dogs dig up something, they use their front paws. And when they bury something at the very end of the dance, we have to have an exit and we're going to uh, go to a prom. Um, uh, that's the reason that we're all dressed up fancy and I've given her this wonderful gift in preparation for the prom. Uh, but now we don't want to share this with the other monsters who are going to be at the prom. Prom, of course, is called the Monster Mash, that's obvious. But uh, what do we do with the severed arm? We put it back under the astroturf. But uh, uh, dogs, when they bury something, they don't use their front paw, they use their back leg. And we use that to uh, bury the arm at the end. Speaking of werewolves, you may hear my cat in the yes. background as it comes in to uh, let me know that it wants to be part of the show. <laughs> well, hey, Muzzle Tough, you may be in the next, the next show. Well, 
we just had a little intrusion with the cat. Now, obviously, if you had a cat in your uh, showcase, that would definitely get some emotions. Give me some other ideas of how you go about getting the audience involved. What do you do to stir their emotions? Well, acting is a very important part of telling a story. You have to have an exaggerated expression of your face. Um, if you're grieving, it's not enough to be just unhappy. It's oh, just exaggeration. And uh, joy, likewise, it's not just a simple smile. But opening up wide and, and throwing your arms out, um, the movement has to be obvious enough so that people feel the emotion that you're trying to express. Um, if you're doing this to entertain people uh, and you're not limited by uh, whatever rules you feel might restrict you in uh, your performance, if it's a competition, especially if you're doing this as a uh, form of entertainment as I like to do it on Friday night parties at Super Shag, um, you can incorporate dance styles within the dance that are not strictly ballroom. And if you do hip hop moves, you can make people laugh because advanced hip hop moves seem to defy the laws of gravity and of physics and people just naturally laugh seeing people doing such contortions that seem uh, physically impossible. And on the other hand, if you can do lifts, then this is the expression in the dance world of giving support to somebody. So if someone has suffered a loss, if they are dying, if they are ill, if they are grieving over a situation, then having a partner who offers them support in the form of a lift um, is a very emotional type of thing and is likely to um, affect the audience and even bring them to tears. Um, so uh, these are uh, important points about bringing in um, the audience. And I'd like to challenge the audience uh, listening to this right now. There is one uh, classical form of ballroom dance that is inherently a storyline. What is that dance form? So uh, I'm giving you uh, a couple of seconds to come up with the answer out there. And the answer is Paso Doble, which is based on bullfighting. And when you see a couple doing a Paso Doble, very often uh, there is tension between the man and woman. Um, and often the dance ends with uh, one conquering or even killing the other um, and they may fall on the floor in a final embrace but what always puzzles me is that the reason for their fighting is never apparent there's never a blatant open storyline it's just that tension is being expressed between the two of them in the dance so how would you create a storyline that accounts for their uh, emotional interaction. So you got three seconds to come up with an answer. One, two, three. Here is my answer. I would have a scene in a saloon where a cowboy is playing poker with a bar girl and one of them cheats on the other. The lady either pulls an ace out of her garter belt or he pulls an ace out of his boot or out of his hat and the other one catches that first person cheating. That now leads to them dancing, a paso doble. They have a reason to be angry with each other and eventually one kills the other. Now, you notice that I don't specify who the cheater and who the killer is, so you can make the storyline to fit it as you choose. The man or the woman could pull the ace out, and the man or the woman could be the one who kills the other. And if you're not happy just having the two of them dance, you can make it an ensemble, because there could be any number of other people in the saloon observing what's going on, 
and either getting in the way between the two of them or scrambling to get out of the way away from the two of them uh, so you can have an ensemble number. Um, so it gives you endless possibilities of pursuing a storyline where the music is pasa doble. So uh, these are some ways in which you can um, you know, get people in the audience involved. Once again, I wouldn't have thought of most of that stuff. So one of the things that I've always noticed when you've done show, showcases is your use of props uh, and of course costumes. So uh, go on, let me know what the uh, thought process is behind all of that. Well, to begin with, I'm not a very good dancer, so using a prop is a good way to uh, 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 get people's attention away from that fact. And by the time they figured out I'm not such a great dancer, they've been wondering what am I going to do with the props. So uh, <laughs> I get away with certain things that otherwise I couldn't. Um, so of course, uh, costumes include the werewolf masks that we've used in a couple of our um, performances. Uh, uh, vampire teeth and uh, vampires want to have fun, another number that we've done. Um, the use of a cane. Um, in uh, You Make Me Feel So Young, uh, the man hobbling out at the beginning, uh, uh, all uh, limp and lame, but uh, brought to life by a young lady who takes the cane away. Uh, so clearly the cane is an essential prop in that uh, storyline. Um, props have to be used uh, with care. Uh, so uh, we did a number where we uh, my partner and I are behind a picture frame in the uh, classic uh, um, uh, painting, so well-known American Gothic, which is a painting of a farmer and a, a woman standing next to him. And he is holding a pitchfork. And um, a pitchfork can be a very dangerous item. This is the actual pitchfork that we used. It's a real one that I purchased uh, at a barn sale in Maine. And um, while we don't actually use the pitchfork in the dance, twirling it around or anything like that, which would be quite dangerous, uh, just holding it and putting it down at one point uh, presented enough of a problem that I carefully put plastic tubing over the ends of the uh, sharp tines to make sure there was no chance in the world that anybody could get stuck on these sharp objects. The other thing is that you can make use of uh, lighting effects and uh, video screens. Uh, there is a large screen available uh, at Super Shag and we've made use of that for projection purposes. So in the dance, um, vampires just want to have fun. Um, and the uh, song that we do it to is if, it, if they could see me now. So by the way, when you have a dance, you can give a name to the dance that is different than the name of the song. Uh, and sometimes that uh, gives it a unique flavor. And the inspiration for that, frankly, came from the TV show, So You Think You Can Dance, where every one of their dances had a unique name to it. Um, but in this uh, particular number, uh, uh, vampires just want to have fun. Um, there's a line in the song, um, uh, and he show, even showed me how he wrote his autograph. And at that moment, we project on the screen uh, the word Dracula uh, with the letters dripping blood. And uh, uh, so uh, that was a, uh, uh, a moment where we could take the words of the song and put it literally to use on the screen and dance to it appropriately. As I say, Len, the amount of uh, effort that you put into some of these shows is just absolutely amazing. Uh, is there anything you think our audience would benefit from in how you actually rehearse? Yes, uh, what is unique, I think, in the performances that I've been talking about is the underlying importance of the storyline itself, separate from the uh, dancing, the choreography. 
so that um, uh, you certainly uh, may want to have your uh, dance moves uh, reviewed and evaluated by uh, a dance instructor in addition to the one that you are directly working with as your partner but you may want someone who is representative of the audience that you're going to be performing for uh, looking at it and saying the storyline hangs together or it doesn't and looking just at the storyline more than at the dancing itself, uh, to me, if my storyline is not being told, to me it doesn't matter how well or how poorly the dancing is done. If I haven't told the story, I have not accomplished what I wanted to do. Not quite the rehearsal uh, aspect, but where do you get your resources? You know, where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I've already referred to uh, some of the life experiences uh -huh. that I've had, uh, recovery from surgery and the like, but a very useful resource is YouTube. And you could enter under search in YouTube the name of an artist. So you, uh, I like the classic numbers by Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, um, and you can just go down the list of their songs and suddenly stop and say, whoa, this is the one. I just suddenly thought of a storyline to go with that particular song. And again, in YouTube, you can enter what you want to tell a story about. I gave you the example of how I wanted to hear songs about fishing. And you can enter songs about fishing and lo and behold, they will give you songs about fishing. So uh, YouTube is a very useful resource. Um, MIT Radio, uh, local of course in the Boston area, has many different radio programs that I thoroughly enjoy listening to uh, that have um, uh, classical jazz, blues, rhythm and blues, um, uh, type of uh, music that you don't hear, it's not today's top 20. Yeah. Uh, but some of the older classics. And just listening to that music, first of all, it's very relaxing for me. I en enjoy it, but again, I will suddenly hear that song and say, wow, that's it, I got a storyline for that one. Uh, so those are some of the resources that I look at. Is there any performance that you have watched, and I'm sure you've watched a hell of a lot, that you thought, okay, that hit everything that I would want to have in something that I would do. Yes, I think an absolute classic is Gene Kelly in Singing in the Rain. And I don't care how young or old you are, almost everybody knows that number where he is literally singing in the rain. Um, this is uh, a Hollywood classic. Gene Kelly himself often expressed surprise that it was as popular as it was because he thought as a dance performance he had done other performances that were technically much more difficult. But it was an absolutely perfect storyline. And um, I want you to think about how the story progresses. Um, you'd have to go back and perhaps review the movie to remember why he is so happy at that moment. Uh, but uh, things are going very well for him. Uh, uh, there is a uh, young lady who is able to perform in a uh, movie that has gone from silent to sound. And uh, they were facing a crisis and how they're going to uh, develop that story, it's going very well, so he is as happy as could be, and even though it's raining, he's able to dance through this rain, and uh, questions that you would ask are, um, other people show up during the performance, uh, they are absolutely wretched and miserable as they're walking down the street, and he, in contrast, is totally happy. Um, and uh, could it have ended in any other way? Hollywood could have ended in any number of ways. The sun could have come out 
and uh, at the end of it, uh, he's dripping wet, but he looks up and he sees the sun shining brightly and it's a brand new day. No, he hands off his umbrella to someone else who's grateful for it, and he skips off happily, still uh, in the soaking rain. The storyline is absolutely perfect. If I was the director of that film, I would not change one single frame. It's an absolutely perfect storyline that's a model for anyone to follow who wants to um, develop this kind of thought process in uh, uh, choreography. Well, Dr. Marcus, you really have given us a lot to think about. Um, guys, I hope you enjoy this, and it is a very different way than most people go about uh, with their showcases. So remember, anything that you want to know about the ballroom dance world, just go to dancebeat.com. Len, thank you so much for taking the time. I, would, I have learned a lot just talking to you. Cheers. Chris, it's a pleasure working with you. I appreciate it very much. You're a joy to work with. And on that, we will say good night.